MMAOddsBreaker.com proudly presents the Premium Oddscast, your home for the best fight picks, bets, analysis, and statistics hosted by leading MMA oddsmaker Nick Kalikas, fight scientist and author of Fightnomics, Reed Coon, and myself, MMA journalist Brian Eminger. Get an inside track from the experts as part of MMAOddsBreaker.com's premium betting service. Welcome to the Premium Oddscast, brought to you by Five Dimes, your home for the best betting picks and analysis straight from the source. MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas, fight scientist and MMA statistics guru Reed Kuhn, and myself, MMA journalist Brian Hemminger. We have uh, several extensive breakdowns and picks and analysis for this upcoming UFC Fight Night 33 event from Brisbane, Australia, taking place this weekend, uh, Friday at uh, primetime, uh, December 6th in the United States, but in uh, Australia, it crosses that international dateline December 7th. So uh, pay attention to that if you're uh, looking up on Wikipedia and stuff. Now, uh, let's roll right into it. Uh, before we get into everything, uh, Reed Coon will be available for all the fights with relevant data. So for a couple preliminary fights, and then we'll be bringing him in for all four of the final main card fights. So it'll be just me and Nick here getting it started. But this first fight, opening up the preliminary card on Facebook, Nick, uh, Alex Garcia comes in at 10 and 1 at the TriStar Gym. A lot of hype. Taken on Aussie native Ben Wall, 7 0 and 1 overall. Uh, Nick, what was the opening line on this, and uh, what's your odds maker's perspective? Well, I opened the line Garcia minus 380, the comeback on Wall plus 260. And looking over at the line right now, five dimes, Garcia's minus 405, Wall's plus 285. So again, slight raise. What I would expect, I mean, like more parlay action and a little bit uh, more action going in towards the favorite here. And I think it's about right. I mean, how these guys match up, of course, Wall coming in here, taking this fight on uh, shorter notice. I mean, he's a former um, Tough Smashes uh, competitor, participant, I should say, lost to uh, Colin Fletcher by unanimous decision. So not necessarily a bad loss on the show. And what Wall brings to the table in this fight is his wrestling and jiu-jitsu base. I mean, he's pretty solid as far as getting takedowns and his grappling goes. He's not exactly out of his realm striking either. So he's a pretty complete fighter, but definitely the best attribute for Wall is um, his grappling, his wrestling, and uh, looking to um, you know get the submission and positional control um, and win fights that way. Now, one thing that does bother me, um, or I should say a couple things that do bother me about this fight in this spot for Wall is, again, one, I said he's coming in on short notice, um, and two is that he's fighting out of his weight class. I mean, he's stepping up to uh, 170 here, which is Garcia's more natural weight class. So I think those two things are going to be problems. And considering the stylistical matchup uh, that he's got with Garcia, so I'm going to get right into Garcia now. I mean, Garcia, as you mentioned, Brian, I mean, the guy has a lot of hype coming in. He's from the TriStar Gym. Of course, that's where GSP and crew train. Um, so that alone in the public eye means a lot, I think, to the casual fan. But that being said, I mean, Garcia has just, he's a beast. I mean, if you look at him, he's a, a short, um, not that short. I mean, he's five foot nine for the weight class, so he's, he's almost about round average. But he's just a powerhouse. I mean, the guy's um, an extremely well-built athlete. Um, he's a very solid all-around fighter. He's got a strong wrestling base. Um, he's very, again, explosive, athletic. He's aggressive everywhere the fight takes place. I mean, the guy has nasty slams. He's got nasty knockout power on the feet, um, and he's got good submission skill to go along with it. So he's basically the same type of fighter Wall is, just nastier and just a little bit better and more dominant. So the bigger, stronger, better fighters to come through more times than not. That's why I opened this line like I did, and that's why we're seeing the line get bet up a little bit more here. I think in order for Wall to win this fight, I mean, he's almost going to have to get lucky. He's going to have to wait or hope hope for Garcia to gas, because if there's any flaws at all, I mean, watching film and then doing the research on Garcia is, he does tend to fade as the fight goes on, no doubt about it. I mean, because he throws with so much power and he's so aggressive, I mean, and with all that muscle mass that he's got on him as well, he definitely does slow down as the fight goes. So that's going to be Wall's, I think, best chance to win. He's got to weather the early storm and hope to wear Garcia up and wear Garcia out enough to get uh, maybe the late stoppage, take his back and uh, sink in a choke or something like that. I don't think it's going to happen. I think Wall's going to get overwhelmed here. I think this fight's probably going to end pretty quick, and Garcia's just going to dominate out of the gate. So, I mean, my pick is going to be Garcia here in this spot. I, I really don't see Wall being the guy to dethrone him, and I think all the hype is just going to continue to climb as Garcia um, continues to win in the UFC. So look, really looking forward to watching him fight because the guy is definitely a prospect to watch out for. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, 
I think the best thing about Garcia is he's got these na nasty killer instinct, ton of power, ton of finishing ability, and he hasn't really let the, the whole Faraz Zahabi game plan stuff corrupt him to where, you know, he fights safe. So, you know, he's out there taking risks and really going at it. You know, and even in his one career loss against Seth Basinski, who's a pretty solid, you know, competent UFC welterweight, you know, he really looked good in that fight, uh, had some nasty takedowns, you know, hurt Basinski, was landing big shots, and, you know, Basinski just got on top of him, and, you know, he wasn't comfortable off of his back. And, you know, I just don't see Ben Wall being able to do that, especially undersized, um, you know, and, you know, you talk about it being a good grappler, you know, maybe he's a good grappler in Australia, but I don't think he's going to be a very good grappler uh, against the rest of the world. And the other thing going forward here is, um, you know, I just don't think Ben Wall's, you know, that talented. He has almost no finishing ability, and you need to have a finishing ability if you're going to be able to come back late and get a stoppage, because worst case scenario, uh, Garcia's going to win the first two rounds, and even if he fades, I don't see Ben Wall being able to stop him. He's just doesn't have a lot of power, and I just don't think he's a good enough grappler or ground fighter to submit Garcia late. So my pick is clearly Alex Garcia here, and I think he should be pretty one-sided. Now, moving on, we have a very intriguing middleweight matchup opening up the Fox Sports 1 broadcast between two 13-0 fighters, Poland's Krzysztof Jotko taking on Brazil's Bruno Santos. Now, uh, Nick, what's your early odds makers perspective here? Well, Santos opens up minus 190, the comeback on Jotko plus 150. So Santos is a little bit more well-known to the public eye. Of course, he's an experienced Bellator vet, um, having a win over Jiva Santana in, in Bellator. So he is a little bit more known, like I said, to the public, I think. Jotko's a, an unknown, relative unknown guy completely. I mean, he's been on the European scene. He's from uh, Poland, actually. And he's a pretty solid fighter, so I'll just get right into him right away here. Um, basically, he's a long rangey fighter. He's got a pretty well-rounded game, um, has some unorthodox striking on the feet, um, tends to be kind of effective. I mean, he, he doesn't look from the tape study and film everything. He doesn't look that impressive as a striker, but he does mix things up with his kicks and his punches well enough that he basically kind of outpoints most of the people that he, he's been in with um, on the feet. Now, that being said, I mean, he hasn't faced an extreme high level of competition, but it's okay compared to some of the other people that have made their debuts in the UFC before as well. So I think he has some potential here. He's just not great in any particular area. I mean, what he looks to do is actually use his striking and use his movement to get the fight to the floor as well. So he does have um, some wrestling that he tries to utilize and get the takedowns, use his ground and pound, um, and look for positional control and kind of tries to grind people out. So he's capable, no matter where the fight takes place, of, of being okay and solid, but he just doesn't excel in any particular area. Now, that being said, going back towards Santos, I mean, he's basically this kind of a similar fighter. I mean, talk about a short, stocky guy. I mean, for middleweight, he, he is short, stocky, but very powerful. Um, but he, again, he doesn't excel in any particular area. His grappling base and his wrestling is probably the most impressive uh, thing about him. He's got pretty good takedown defense, and he's pretty agile, I mean, for being that strong and uh, powerful, really, for a little guy. I mean, he, he moves relatively well, has decent takedown defense. So I guess I should give him a little bit more credit where credit's due. I'm not making him sound worse than he is. He's pretty solid when it comes to being a strong wrestling-based fighter. But on the feet, he still needs to develop his skill a little bit more. He tends to be a little bit uh, too inactive for my liking. He does have a lot of power, and he looks to throw with a lot of power. And he does have decent leg kicks as well. But overall, he just doesn't do it for me on the feet. He needs to get Jotko on the, on the floor, control, and um, and look to grind him out because that's how he wins, definitely. I mean, he's got 11 wins by decision if you look at Santos's record. But then again, Jotko's got seven of his wins by decision as well. So both these guys are probably going to hit the cards, and I think it's going to be a competitive decision, and it's who's going to maintain control of this fight. I think more times than not, it's probably going to be Santos. So that's why I'm going to um, lean that way. I think Santos is probably the better fighter at this point um, in, in this career. So going to pick Santos for this fight. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, you know, Jotko does have a couple variables going for him. I think he's a little bit better on the feet, a little more technical. Uh, he's a little more explosive, too. You know, Santos does have some power, but, you know, he's he's not that quick, and he doesn't land that often. Uh, the, the main thing looking for me is Santos is all about control. He's, you know, the prototypical grinder. You know, he's got a four-and-a-half-year decision streak going over ten fights in a row. So... Uh, you know, that's just what he does. You know, he takes fighters down, he gets them against the fence, he gets them on their back, and, you know, he works them over. 
but he doesn't have a lot of finishing potential. And you know, I, I just I'm not sure that Jotko has faced a fighter that's like Santos. You know, they probably haven't faced fighters like each other. You know, overall, but uh, the Jotko is gonna get in there, and Santos is gonna put a lot of pressure on him, really grind against him, and try to get him on his back and keep him there. And uh, you know, from looking at tape and everything, I just I'm not sure that Jotko has the ability to, to get up if taken down, or uh, to you know how how he'll handle you know, being stuck on his back for extended periods of time, because I don't think he'll be able to do the same thing to Santos. Santos is, uh, you know, wins a lot of scrambles, uh, and he's just a grinder. He's a nasty grinder, and I think uh, his streak continues. Uh, so, you know, with one person's O get having to go, uh, I think it's Jotko's O. <laughs> so, uh, throwing out some rhyming there, but uh, I like Bruno Santos here. He's he's strong, stocky, and he should be able to control Jotko over the course of three rounds. So we got to trust the judges to make the right call, but uh, I think the right call should be Santos. Now, a very intriguing flyweight battle getting tossed together here. Uh, thrown in about two weeks' notice for both guys, Justin Scoggins taking on uh, Richie Vesulik. Uh, Vesulik is obviously an uh, Australian native, fought on the Ultimate Fighter uh, Tough Smashes season. But uh, two really intriguing flyweight prospects. So, uh, Nick, what's your take on this one, and uh, you know how the lines kind of move since you opened it earlier? Scoggins minus 150, Vasulik plus 110. That was my opening number. Um, right now, at the time of the recording, um, Scoggins is at minus 215 at five dimes. So, initial support coming in that way, and it's hard to argue. I mean, looking at the film study, I know Vasulik is a former tough smashes vet, as you mentioned. I mean, that was at 155. This is at 125. So, a big drop, and I think. Based on just pure ability and tape study from Vasulik, I mean, he's a pretty talented fighter, no doubt about it. I mean, the guy basically looks to take the fight to the floor as well, utilize wrestling, utilize grappling. And I know, as Brian mentioned, I mean, a lot of the Australian-based or a lot of the um, European-type fighters, doesn't, their wrestling doesn't compare a lot of times to, of, of course, the wrestler stateside. But for that type of level, I mean, he's pretty pretty decent, I mean, as far as the grappling and submission game goes, especially his threat in submissions. I mean, he's got some pretty sly, slick, slick uh, subs from his back um, and even in top position. So that's going to be his edge here, definitely, over Scoggins because Scoggins is a world-class striker, basically, is what you're getting with him. I mean, he's going to look to take this fight and keep it on the feet and just utilize his strength, which will be moving around, his kicks, his boxing. I mean, he's basically a karate-style fighter, kickboxing style fighter that excels so well in MMA with his striking because he's worked on his overall game. Scoggins has some decent wrestling, has some decent um, takedown defense to go along with it. So that's why he has had success on, of course, a lower scale with um, outside of the UFC. But again, by tape study and everything that you dig up, you could really see the potential. I mean, I'm, I have been nothing but impressed with everything and all the research I've done on Scoggins. I think that um, unlike some of the other karate-based fighters that have come into the UFC, I think Scoggins is going to have a lot of success because he is probably ahead of the curve as far as being a more complete fighter. I mean, he trains with decent people. ATT, he, he, I did hear that he trained with Jacksons at one point as well. So he's getting out there training um, with the right partners to complete and evolve his game as he needs to. Because, again, if he does go to the ground with Vasulik, I think he's going to be at a disadvantage there because Vasulik's submission game, pure submission game, is going to be better at this point of their careers. But overall, I think Scoggins is probably going to be able to keep this fight standing and utilize his awesome um, striking attack, probably land a highlight reel knockout with a leg kick, um, a high kick, to, you know, somewhere along the way he's probably going to end up ending this fight, I think, by KO. Um, if not, I think he's going to do enough to steal um, two rounds at least um, and hit the scorecards uh, with an easy decision here. So I think this Scoggins um, is the side here. I think he more times than not should win this fight. And my only concern, again, would be Vasulik's slick submission game. If he does get position on Scoggins, uh, he could be in some trouble there. But i um, really looking forward to this fight. And the sports books are probably going to be pretty even on this fight, um, regardless of what's out there and the movement goes. I'm going to try to keep them, if they listen, pretty even on this fight. Yeah, and I'm in complete agreement. Scoggins might be one of the next big things in the flyweight division. Um, he is just a tremendous athlete and is capable of doing a lot of things that you know nobody else can really do in that division. Uh, he kind of reminds me of a Stephen Thompson esque with his striking, except you know a lot more dangerous. Uh, you know, Thompson, you know, 
sometimes you know he's, he fades and everything. Scoggins has a great gas tank. He's real scary, very explosive, a lot more explosive than Thompson was in the the welterweight division, and. Uh, you know, he can hit these just crazy kicks. I mean, there's some insane highlights of this kid all over YouTube. Um, you know, he throws these hook kicks and spinning kicks and flying kicks. Um, his kicks are just insanely, insanely scary. Now, uh, Vesulik, you know, he does have a good ground game. I'm not going to discount it just because he's Australian. You know, he wins scrambles. He goes in there against wrestlers, and, and he taps these guys out. He's really good in... Uh, uh, just making quick transitions and finding those openings and exploiting them. So, you know, Vasulik absolutely needs to get this fight to the ground. You know, he has respectable boxing. You know, he has a little bit of power in his hands, but he wants nothing to do with Scoggins on the feet. He's just asking for it if he sticks around there too long. But, uh, you know, the best avenue of attack here for Vasulik is to shoot in and force a scramble. Even if he has to pull guard, just get on the ground. Maybe he can make something happen. Uh, Scoggins, I'm not sure he'll let him. He's very athletic. He is also a really good balance. You know, there are multiple times where guys try to take him down and fight, and he just turns the corner on him and lands on top and then, you know, gets out of there. Uh, he really only goes in on the ground uh, unless uh, there's a really good submission opportunity, which I don't think will be presented against Vasulik, or uh, ground and pound after he hurts somebody standing. So that's the only way I see Scoggins going to the ground with uh, Vasulik is if he hurts him and he wants to just finish him off. So uh, my pick is definitely Scoggins, and uh, yeah, I really, really like this kid. And our next fight here on the UFC preliminary card, Kyle Magalhaes with a 6-1 and one record taking on Nick Ring, 13-2 and two in the middleweight division. Uh, Nick, what is the, the betting perspective on this one? Uh, where'd you open the line? What's the movement? Uh, what's your take? Well, my opener was actually Ring minus 230, Magalhaes plus 170. That was a comeback. And this is a weird fight for me. I mean, and I think the general action out there uh, proves it as well because the line's staying kind of steady. Um, usually, typically, in most cases, when a uh, betting line hits the sports books, you see some action um, going towards the favorites and the line increases a little bit. And in this spot right now, looking over at five dimes, um, Ring's only minus 245. So there's been limited action on Nick Ring, and it's probably, I would think, and I would guess that it's mostly parlay action since the line um, did open up. So it's a good spot to open, and I think it's a, a fair spot as far as the line goes. It's about right because Nick Ring does have several advantages in this fight. I mean, let's face it, Magalhaes has not, Magalhaes has not been very impressive um, in, in the UFC at all. I mean, he lost to Buddy Roberts in what was, I think, a very fair decision. Um, and then he goes out, and he does come back and submit uh, Vimola in his last fight, um, which he needed to because he was down, uh, of course, on round one after the scorecards. But... That being said, I did see some improvement in his game. Um, I think his cardio is improvement. And just to get to him a little bit briefly right now, I mean, Magalhaes is basically, for those that might not know out there, he's a ground specialist. I mean, he looks to take the fight to the floor and work his BJJ, work his positional control. Um, he does have a little bit of improved striking. I mean, he has a long way to go in that area, though. But he's only 25 years old to his credit, so I think little by little I have seen some improvements in his game. And he does have some power on the feet. He swings crazy punches. I mean, not very technical, but, I mean, it's one of these guys that can throw a blind haymaker and catch and maybe uh, give you some problems. So, that being said, Nick Ring, on the other hand, his strike defense is pretty bad. Not that uh, he should have a, be at a disadvantage in this fight with his striking, because he does have an advantage, I think, in the striking realm. But his strike defense is pretty bad, and he has been tagged and rocked. And Magalhaes definitely has enough power to do that. Um, I don't think, again, he's going to have the advantage. Ring will have the advantage, and he is a superior striker with his movement, um, with his leg kicks, with his kicking arsenal in general. Um, he comes in with counter punches well, too, in and out. And he does things overall. His game is pretty solid. His wrestling base is uh, pretty decent, and he spot better competition overall as well. So wherever this fight takes place, I think um, Nick Ring is going to be game. And actually, he should be able to stuff most of Magalhaes' takedowns. But the interesting thing is, is, is Nick Ring really fading that bad? A lot of people out there, I think, are speculating that he is kind of a little bit on the decline. He hasn't looked good in his recent performances. But that being said, I still think with his attributes, I think he could keep this fight up. I think he can probably outpoint Magalhaes, to say the least, and get the decision here. So I'm going to pick Nick Ring, but as far as betting goes, man, I think it's almost one of these situations where you've got to almost consider a dog bet. Now, again, we, we'll have our final bets on the premium odds cast um, later on for part two. So I'm not recommending a play on Mega Lace, but uh, you do want to check out part two if that's the case here. But it's one of those situations where I think you almost got to say dog or pass. But I do think Nick Ring gets a W here because he should be able to dictate where the fight goes and basically outpoint Mega Lace. Yeah, Nick Ring scares the hell out of me, to be honest. I mean, 
He had he's three and two in the UFC, but in all honesty, I mean he should be uh, one and four. Uh, his UFC debut, Ricky Fukuda, you know he clearly lost that fight and got a gift decision from the judges. Uh, same thing, the Court McGee fight at UFC 149. You know it was a really close competitive fight, but you know most people thought Court McGee did enough to win it, but uh, just you know it didn't happen. And then even even his one you know decisive UFC win when he choked out James Head, you know he he was losing that fight and then got a, a late submission when when Head completely gassed in the third round. So you know he's just not quite the same fighter that he used to be uh, before the knee injury. You know he had a, a bit more explosion. He was a lot pretty dynamic. Uh, he had a lot of hype behind him heading into the Ultimate Fighter, and you know it just it didn't really pay off. So I'm not really sure. You know that being said, you know. Kyle Magalhaes, I just don't think is a very good fighter. Uh, you know, his UFC debut, he looked bad. He didn't look that good even in his win over Vemela. And I just, I just don't think that he has a lot of talent. And uh, it, that scares me too. So you know, this is definitely a fight that I'm probably going to avoid at all costs because I do think Nickering is better. I don't know if I can trust him anymore though. So, uh, Reed, what do the numbers tell you on this fight? Well, I think a lot of the conclusions you've drawn are supported with the facts. Uh, Michael Ace, he does have a little bit of octagon time to look at. He is definitely, he has that stat line profile that I see very commonly for people that have generally historically relied on their submission skills. He has terrible striking accuracy, uh, which you mentioned, Nick. Um, his pace isn't very good. He doesn't control fights when they're on the feet. He's swinging and he's missing. He certainly hasn't hurt anybody. Uh, and he tries a lot of takedowns. He's really pressing forward, and when someone attempts that many takedowns per round, uh, which he's way up there on this card, uh, almost close with Anthony Perosh, who's another uh, very focused grappler, these guys don't land a lot of them. He has a takedown success rate that is 18%, which for people that are actually attempting takedowns for real is the lowest of anybody on the card, and it's way below average. So. Uh, when you have a situation where someone's a, known for being very, not one-dimensional, but almost one-dimensional, it makes it easier to game plan against them because you, you aren't really fearing the striking, and so you can pay more attention to that takedown defense. So if Nick Ring is a smart fighter, and I, I've met the guy, he's actually a very smart guy, a very thoughtful guy, uh, hopefully he knows that, and he knows to stay moving, to circle, uh, to look for those telegraphed shooting takedowns and to get out of the way and and then outpoint and he is capable of doing that he's a very good striker um, he hasn't he just hasn't really dominated anyone but this is a situation where if he is in a striking exchange he will get the better of it um, so I do think he is a worthy favorite but then I also see there there is risk here because you know ring hasn't necessarily proven that he can hang on the ground with very high level grapplers he's gotten mostly in these kind of uh, exchanging type fights. So there, we, we have yet to really see him get tested by a high level black belt. And I think he, he might get tested if, if he gets put on his back. But question is, will he do the smart thing and stay mobile, stay on his wheels and uh, make this more of a, a point striking. And, you know, with, with his skills and with Nigel uh defense, maybe he lands something that, you know, hurts him early. So, kind of up in the air, but um, at least the statistics do support the profiles that these two guys are known for. Yeah, and, and I didn't really throw my pick out here. I'm picking Ring, but uh, one thing to take into consideration is uh, Mangaleish, you know, he is a lot younger. Ring's 34, uh, Mangaleish is 25, has a lot more room for growth and improvement. He does train out of Nova Uniao, so, you know, he might be getting a little bit better. You know, we haven't seen him in a while. So that's something to take into consideration. I'm still picking Ring because he should be better on the feet. He should be able to keep it on the feet. He has pretty solid defensive wrestling. So that's why I'm going that way. Now, the final fight on the preliminary card is a bantamweight contest between Takeya Mitsugaki, who comes in with a... Uh, <laughs> he comes in with an 18-7 and 2 overall record, uh, taking on Nam Fan, who's dropping down to the bantamweight division for the first time at 18 and 11. Now, Nick, uh, you just opened this line earlier today. Uh, what it, what's the early movement telling you? Well, my opening line was Mizugaki minus 270, the comeback plus 190 on Fan, 
And actually, that line, again, almost the same situation as um, the Nick Ring fight that we were just talking about. A little bit of movement on uh, Mizugaki. Again, I'm sure that's mostly parlay action. It's only minus 280 right now to come back around 200 for fan. And as we get closer to fight time, of course, all these lines are going to tighten up, and uh, you're going to see, of course, more value on both sides. But um, that's the spot that it's at now. So I think it's a, a pretty stable, steady line. Um, it, and it's, it basically reflects on Mizugaki's advantage on the ground. I mean, both these guys are very talented strikers. I think um, if it stays on the feet, Fan has a great shot. Let's get right into Fan, actually. I mean, he is dropping down to 135. We should note that as well. He's, um, I've been on a little slump, of course, as we all know. But you know what? I mean, the guy is a game fighter. He shows up, and he has a ton of heart on the feet, which I just mentioned a little bit. I mean, the guy's very talented, mixes up um, his striking arsenal well, throws kicks, body punches, attacks to the head well with his boxing, um, and he brings it. I mean, he, the guy's a very busy, active fighter. So on the feet, I don't think it's an easy task by any means uh, with Mizugaki. Even though Mizugaki is a very capable striker, his boxing is pretty solid. But I think that uh, Mizugaki is going to look to take this fight to the floor, and that's where fans' weakness it really is. I mean, he's got some sub skills for sure, but against strong wrestlers, they, they're able to stay out of sub trouble. I mean, Fan has problems. That's why he's getting beat recently. So this drop, um, and depending on how much he's worked on his takedown defense and wrestling, is what's going to reflect um, – how this fight plays out, I think, how strong he is in this weight class, how the weight cut went. And again, he has to really close the gap on his takedown defense and wrestling. Now, the other hand, Mizugaki was basically, I think last time against Perez, I mean, they were basically feeding him to the up-and-coming prospect. I think a lot of people were expecting Perez to get the W, that he was a favorite coming in. So Mizugaki pulled off an underdog uh, upset win. He looked very impressive in that fight. I mean, he's just a well-rounded, solid fighter that doesn't make a lot of mistakes. I mean, his wrestling base is, again, solid, especially for a Japanese fighter. Um, his boxing's okay. His submission savvy, especially with his submission defense, is pretty good as well. So he's no easy out. So I think the line's about fair, but I'm expecting this fight to be a lot more competitive, I think, than people think. So Mizugaki will probably squeak out maybe a 29-28 type of decision, I think, or we could see a split decision. Um, it depends, again, on fan if he's able to keep this fight up or not. But I think that's how it's going to play out. I think Mizugaki does get the W here, probably by a close decision, competitive decision. And, and I agree on the feet. Uh, you know, Mizugaki is pretty solid, but Nam Fan's very experienced up there. He mixes things up well. Uh, the one thing, you know, Mitsugaki surprised me a little bit that he was able to outwork Eric Perez on the feet in his last fight. And, you know, Perez is a guy that came in with a, a lot of hype behind him. So, you know, he's got that going for him. The biggest difference here is on the ground. It's hands down. Um, you know, Nam Fan, for some reason, even though he's got that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, he's a talented grappler, whenever he gets stuck on his back, he d becomes an absolute punching bag. Uh, you look at his fights against Dennis Seaver, Jimmy Hedges, Mike Brown, in the one round that he got taken down, um, when he gets stuck on his back, he eats a ton of punishment and a lot of shots. You know, he doesn't usually get finished on the ground, but uh, he just takes uh, just a boatload of punishment. And Mitsugaki's the type of guy that can take advantage of that. I mean, you saw in his fight against Jeff Hoagland where, you know, he got on top of Hoagland and he just unleashed hell on him. So, you know, if he can get on top of Nam Fan, you know, I expect a very similar result. It just all depends if he can get himself in a situation to take advantage of Nam Fan's weakness because Nam Fan is pretty solid on the feet, you know. He outstruck Cole Miller. Um, he outstruck Leonard Garcia, which isn't the hardest thing in the world to do. But, uh, you know, he does have some talent up there. So uh, that's my take on it. But uh, So I am picking Takeya Mitsugaki. I think he can utilize that. And uh, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this fight? Because uh, there's quite a bit of statistics on both guys. Yeah, there's a ton of data on these guys. I've got hours of uh, cage time for both guys. And um, but once again, I think the stats agree with you. And if this does stay standing, Nam Fan is actually a very accurate striker, which is a difficult thing to do in that weight class. The smaller guys tend to be a little bit more evasive, but he actually has very high accuracy, both with his power hand and his jab. He doesn't necessarily control fights. That's usually something you see with longer reached fighters, and he's not in that category. Uh, but he's not at a disadvantage in this, in this case. Now, on the ground, it's a different story. Mizugaki has very good takedown accuracy. He has good takedown defense. And when on the ground, he has spent the vast majority of it in a position of control. Nam Fan, only 14% of his minutes on the ground were in control. That means he was on his back for a lot of that time. So that definitely looks like a vulnerability. Um, depending on where the lines go and depending on whether or not you think Nam Fan can keep it standing and, and win a point strike, uh, we'll see. We'll have to see where the lines end up. Um, it certainly looks like Fan can hold his own 
if he becomes a big underdog and is able to keep the standing, he, he could pull off an upset here on his feet. Um, but he definitely looks vulnerable if this goes to the mat, and uh, we wouldn't be surprised to see Mizugaki try to take it there. So, um, again, the, the numbers tend to match up with our assessments. Uh, it will be interesting to see where the lines play out. And another thing to keep an eye out for is the, the over 2.5 rounds. I mean, Mitsugaki comes in at uh, 10 decisions in his last 12 fights, and, and Nam Fan has gone to a decision in every single UFC fight, even the ones that he takes a, a horrific beating. So uh, keep an eye out for that line. Uh, maybe worthy of a play. And opening up the main card on Fox Sports 1 is an intriguing women's bantamweight battle between veteran Julie Kedzie with a 16-12 and 12 record taking on uh, UFC debuting prospect uh, Brazilian Beth Correa at 6-0. and Now, Nick, uh, you opened the line earlier today. Uh, what's your take on this one? My opener, Kedzie, minus 190 to come back on Correa, plus 150. So looking at the line over at five times right now, movement on Kedzie coming in early on. It's Kedzie minus 245, Correa plus 175. So support on the savvy vet. You know, I wasn't which, sure which way the public was going to come in on this fight. I mean, in my opinion, I think it's going to be a very competitive fight. But, of course, Kedzie is the more well-known fighter. But a lot of times when you get these Brazilian prospects, even in the women's division, they do tend to get a little bit of respect. So kind of, I guess, surprised that uh, Kedzie line moved up a little bit. Um, but I guess not overly shocked either because there's a lot of unknowns about Carrera. Um, I, I guess I should start off with Carrera first here, getting into her. So she is a little bit more unknown. I mean, overall, she's a solid fighter. You can definitely see some improvements in her overall game. I mean, she's more of a striking, a striking base fighter. I mean, she's coming out of uh, the Pitbull Brothers camp, the Pitbull Brothers that are in Bellator. So you know how those guys fight, those of you guys that have followed their careers. I mean, nasty, um, powerful stand-up strikers. Um, but at, at the same time, they do have a competent ground game to go along with it. Um, but, again, that's kind of not what they look to do. They don't look to um, get submissions, and that's basically what uh, Carrera is. She looks to kind of keep the fight up, standing, and outpoint you and uh, maybe land that kind of knockout punch. Now, she doesn't have a ton of knockout power. Uh, she only has one KO on her resume, but that being said, it's probably more than uh, that indicates. I mean, uh, slightly more. It doesn't have a lot of nasty knockout power, and I don't think she's going to knock out Kedzie in this spot. I think she's just going to try again to be the busier fighter, keep this fight on the feet, and pretty much grind out a decision win over Kedzie here. And that's very possible because Kedzie, again, could be on the slight decline, um, but Kedzie does have some advantages in this fight. Again, based on her track record, I mean, she has okay wrestling offensively. Um, defensively, it's, it's decent. Um, it's okay as well. Uh, so she's able to keep the fight and dictate where the fight goes more times than not. Um, she is a busy striker. She is active, even though some of her techniques are sloppy at times. She's not the most technical fighter. And, again, that's not kind of a dish to her, but it just seems like if you're looking at footage, she just doesn't have maybe the confidence she needs in her striking at times because it tends to get a little bit sloppy. Um, but it can be effective because she is, again, a kind of a little bit more powerful than I think people realize, too, as far as a striker goes because he has a, a bigger punch than people think is what I'm trying to say. Um, and with her aggression, I think it does cause problems to a lot of people. But in this fight, I think Carrera is going to be the person that's going to be kind of picking her shots and outpointing uh, Kezi a little bit more. It all depends on what Kezi could do and kind of grind her out, put her against the fence, look for a takedown, and try to basically follow the same game plan she did against Deronda May. Now, in that fight, she ended up losing a competitive decision, but I think Carrera is a different type of fighter, and Kezi could probably get the decision win over Carrera here in this spot. Now, Again, where the line indicates where it's going right now, I'm not sure there could be some value on uh, Carrera as a dog here because I do think it's getting out of hand. I do expect a competitive decision. But as far as a pure pick goes, I have to back Kedzi because she has been in there with the solid veterans. I think she has the more complete, tested game, and I think that it's probably going to be a close enough de decision that you've got to kind of lean towards the vet here. But wouldn't be shocking at all if Carrera does get the upset win, and this is a good spot for her to come in and to make some waves in the UFC um, women's division. So interesting fight looking forward to it but my slight slight lean is going to be Kedzie in this spot yeah and something that that concerns me you know obviously Julie Kedzie's on a three fight losing streak uh Correa's coming in as this you know hot shot prospect but you know as much as people call her like this you know young prospect you know she's 30 years old Kedzie's 32 I mean there's not a huge uh gap in age here and uh something to take into consideration uh you know Kedzie and Correa, usually they like to, to keep fights standing. Uh, Kedzie showcased in the Misha Tate fight. She has some nice power. You know, she dropped her a couple times, was winning that fight until it went to the ground and she got armbarred. But um, 
when Kedzie, you know, is is in trouble or, you know, she's losing a fight, she kind of resorts to this control where, you know, she maybe pushes somebody against the fence for an extended period of time or takes them down and just lays on them. You know, she doesn't really have that killer instinct uh, on the ground, at least. Uh, you know, she's more about control in those areas. You know, on the feet, you know, she can she can be a firecracker. She can really go after it uh, in the stand-up. But uh, everywhere else, it's, it's more about just, you know, trying to dictate the fight. So, you know, if the fight goes to the ground, uh, maybe Kedzi is able to delay and pray a few minutes and, and gain some points with the judges. Same thing in the clinch. You know, she might be able to be a little bit physically stronger than Correa and, and uh, control that area. But on the feet, uh, Correa likes to put a lot of pressure. She moves forward. Um, you know, she, she does a good job. And Kedzie, you know, she's not that technical, but she does have some power. She, you know, is sneaky at times. You know, she's really able to, to land some good strikes. So, you know, I'm leaning just on the, the veteran ability of Kedzie to come in here, but it's not confident Correa could come in here and, you know, look amazing. But we just haven't seen it yet from uh, her fights in Brazil, although she did just beat the, the girl that is the only one to ever beat Cyborg Santos in our last fight. So that is interesting. But uh, my pick is Kedzi, not a lot of confidence in it. Now, uh, the next fight here on the main card is a battle between Ultimate Fighter Season 17 veterans as uh, Clint Hester, with an 8-3 and three record, takes on Dylan Andrews at 17-4. and four. Now, uh, what's your early take uh, from the oddsmaker's perspective here, Nick? Hester minus 145 to come back on Andrews plus 05. That was my opening line. And looking at five dimes right now, the line flipped. I mean, early support coming in on Andrews. He's now a buck 45 himself. So a lot of people believe that Andrews will win this fight. I don't know. I mean, this is a fight that's very competitive on paper, um, and it should play out very competitive here as well. I, I know Andrews has several advantages um, coming into this fight because he's the more complete overall fighter. I mean, he's a solid veteran. Um, has a more impressive resume, no doubt about it, and he continues to improve his game. Um, no matter where the fight takes place for Andrews, this is what I like about him. I mean, if the fight takes place on the feet, he's not out of his realm. He, he could definitely be effective in the striking department. Um, he mixes in his boxing and even has some kicks and knees, and his fight IQ is decent on the feet, um, and he has some good power to back it up as well. Now, Another impressive part of his game is actually he has a little bit of underrated grappling and wrestling as well. I mean, he, he does look to take the fight to the floor and use ground and pound, maybe get positional control, and use his grappling for uh, submissions too. So he attacks wherever the fight takes place. He does have a little bit of weakness, though, on the ground. You can't put him on his back and maybe control and out-wrestle him there. And, of course, on the feet, he does get tagged a little bit too much for my liking. But that being said, he is the better, more complete fighter. So I do understand why the early action did come in that way um, towards Andrews. That being said, Hester is in a good spot here. And what I've been impressed with him the most is, I mean, he's just an athlete, and he continues to improve his overall game. You look at the footage before he got into the Ultimate Fighter, he wasn't that impressive. I mean, you could see that he packs a lot of power. I mean, again, he's an explosive athlete, but he had so many holes in his game. And then he coming on to the Ultimate Fighter, I mean, even – in the house. You could see he was developing some of his game. I mean, after all, Hester was the first pick of John Jones in the house, so I mean, there was a lot of potential and a lot of hype coming in, a lot of believers in Hester. It didn't really play out on the show. I think it is going to play out more after the show, though. I mean, his debut against Marunde in the UFC, he did what he had to do. A lot of people weren't impressed by his performance, but I do continue to see the gradual improvement in Hester's game. And for me, his boxing's okay. He's got a lot of power. He's utilizing more strikes in, with his uh, boxing as well, with the elbows, with his knee attack, and he's just so powerful. And I think he can be the more effective striker here with his power. So that's where he's going to give fits to Andrews. I think he can land more and be more effective, do more damage, possibly knock Andrews out, possibly steal around by rocking him and, and basically keeping the fight upright. Now, that's the concern, though, because if Hester has any weakness, it's definitely his ground game. It's being taken down. It's being controlled. It's being submitted. But I know that Hester's been working extremely hard on his wrestling, um, and the ability to keep it on the feet is getting better. I mean, offensively and defensively, he's improving in that area. So I think it's his level of improvement is going to continue to get better and better. So that's probably not a good spot for Andrews in this fight. That's why I'm leaning a little bit more towards Hester, because I think he's going to be able to control where the fight goes. He's not going to be able to um, let he Andrews dictate – the pace of this fight, and Hester's going to do the more damage on the feet and land the more effective strike. So I'm going to slightly lean towards Hester in this spot here. Um, I am expecting a very competitive fight, though, and I hope it plays out the way I think it does. But 
I can't wait for this fight, really, because one of these guys is going to take a huge step forward in the 185 class, and one of these guys is going to earn that much more respect. So my pick is going to be Hester. All right, and, and I'm in semi-agreement here. Uh, the main thing is uh, it's about potential. You know, Dylan Andrews, you know, 34 years old, uh, you know, he's about as good as he's going to get. And overall, he probably is a little bit more of a complete mixed martial artist than Clint Hester. Hester, 27, first pick of John Jones's team. Uh, Andrews came in as the last pick. And, uh, you know, Hester does have a lot of potential, but still a lot of holes in his game. Obviously, the ground game still needs work. Uh, you know, he's been submitted uh, a couple times uh, before in his professional career, and then, you know, he got tapped out on the show. It wasn't a very good uh, performance there. But I think that he has a lot more potential than Dylan Andrews. And if he is shoring up these holes in his game, if he's becoming more complete, then he'll be able to utilize what he does best, which is the stand-up. Uh, he has respectable striking. You know, he was a, a former professional boxer. He's got a lot of talent there in pure boxing. MMA boxing, that's still yet to be said, but uh, he has a lot of power. Uh, his techniques is, are improving. Uh, you saw that just nasty elbow in his last fight that basically saved the fight because it was pretty br brutal before then uh, how bad it was against uh, Bristol Marunde, but uh, you know, I do think that Clint Hester has um, some decent potential here, and uh, you know, Dylan Andrews, a lot of heart uh, displayed in his UFC fights, you know, fighting through injuries, uh, going in there and down on the cards and knocking out Papi Abedi, but I I'm just not sure, uh, you know, Papi Abedi and Jimmy Quinlan is two UFC wins, not exactly uh, impressive victories, you know, really low on the totem pole guys, although Quinlan did uh beat Clint Hester on the show, but uh, I just don't think that Hester or uh, Andrews would be able to take advantage of Hester's bad ground game just because, you know, Andrews doesn't really have that good of a ground game either. You know, he's more wanting to stand and bang just like Hester, and uh, in regards to this, you know, their stand-up ability, while they're both powerful, Hester should be the more complete stand-up fighter and more technical. So unless Andrews is able to really make this a brawl, then I see Hester being able to control the stand-up enough to at least win a decision, if not knock him out. So uh, I agree, and I am picking Clint Hester as well. Now moving on to the big boys, we have a very solid main card attraction between some big-time sluggers. Pat Berry, 8-6 and six record overall, taking on Soa Palele, 19-3. A um, lot of power, a uh, lot of striking ability between these guys. And uh, I, I'm very interested to hear what you have to say on this one, Nick, especially uh, after you open the line. Well, my opener was actually Barry, minus 260, the comeback on Playley, plus 180. So a lot of action. Well, honestly, the original action, believe it or not, uh, spiked up on Barry, and he climbed to almost a 3-1 to one favorite. And then um, some immediate action hopping on the dog, and it's brought the line all the way down steady because of, uh, Playley's been getting bet steady, I should say, since uh, that time. And right now, um, Barry's all the way down to minus 150. Um, so this has been a, a significant change since my opener, and the public is supporting the dog here. And I can understand because, I mean, look at uh, the way Barry's performed recently. He hasn't been that impressive at all. I mean, a lot of people do believe he's on the decline. Um, but that being said, Playley's never really impressed me <laughs> that much at all either. I mean, the guy's one of those heavyweights that uh, – kind of a journeyman fighter that's been around a while uh, on the smaller organizations or, you know, of course, in Europe and on that kind of circuit. He'll do okay against decent heavyweights. But in the UFC, I, I question if he's even UFC level. Um, and in his last fight against Krylov, I mean, I know he ended up winning that fight, so you've got to give him credit. But, you know, he, he basically quit a few times in that fight. He wanted to quit. Uh, he told the referee he was done. His corner won him that fight. So to me, his heart and his value drops just because of that. I mean, alone, I don't have much respect for him as far as that goes. Um, because, he, I mean, like I said, I think his corner pulled him through. Um, it, the kind of fighter, I guess I should say, how Pulele fights. I mean, he's, got, he's a big guy. I mean, he's 6'4". Um, he's going to weigh in at the limit probably around 265, no doubt about it. He has kind of what I hear he has a difficult weight cut as well. So a big guy, powerful guy, looks to take the fight to the floor, um, use wrestling, use ground and pound, um, and has – kind of a submission game, but it's nothing very impressive. None of his ac actually attributes are that impressive, but he will have that advantage over Barry because Barry is basically still a one-trick pony. I mean, the guy's an amazing kickboxer. Offensively, he's very talented, with brutal leg kicks. I mean, a lot of knockout power in his hands and feet. Um, he's worked on his takedown defense. It is improving. He's worked on his ground game. It is improving. But Pelele still has him um, when it comes to the ground edge. So I think a lot of people out there are supporting Pelele because of that factor. Um, because he does have a good ground edge. He does have a lot of knockout power. Barry 
has been KO'd recently. So Pulele could get lucky, even though Barry's a better striker, and even knock him out on the feet, possibly. So I do understand why the people are betting the way they are. Um, for me, based on the opening line, I really did think that people would support Barry. He's a popular fighter. I mean, let's face it out there. Um, the support on Twitter, the support with the UFC. He stuck around the UFC where a lot of fighters probably would have been cut. So I figured the people would have. I did open the line a little bit higher than um, I should have based on his popularity a little bit more and the hype. I figured people would back him a little bit more. So, again, I do think the line is closer and about right where it should be now. Maybe Barry should be a slightly higher, about a buck seventy, buck eighty, realistically. I'm just under a two-to-one favorite based on – his ability to get the knockout over Pulele, because I do think he does have still the advantages, even if the fight does go to the floor early on. I think he can survive, and then Pulele gas is so bad that I think Barry's going to eventually, even if he does get put on his back, work back up to his feet and find um, the knockout and probably put Pulele out, because I do think if uh, Barry can survive the initial onslaught that Pulele comes at him with, Pulele's going to fold again, his heart again is going to come into play here, and I think Barry does have more heart. I think Barry realizes how important this fight is for him. He's got to get the W, and this is a very winnable fight for him. Let's face it. I mean, I know it's in uh, Pelelia's backyard, but Barry can win this fight, and he should win this fight more times than not. Now, am I thrilled about the line? Am I going to jump out to bet him at minus 160, minus 170? You guys are going to have to stay tuned to part two of the premium odds cast, but uh, that's where it gets a little tricky here. I'm not necessarily going to back Barry as a bet, but I am going to pick him to win this fight because he is the better fighter, and he should realistically get the W here. Yeah, and, and I agree that Barry is the better fighter. Uh, I'm not sure I agree about the whole ground thing. I think both guys are really sloppy there on the canvas. Uh, neither guy really has shown anything, any really improvement, other than you know potentially being able to drop some ground and pound or something. But uh, you know what's, this fight is almost certainly going to take place on the feet, and the biggest difference here for me is I think Pat Barry is definitely more technical. Barry's more athletic. Barry's quicker. Um, Pulele has some of the uh, statistical edges in terms of uh, the measurables. You know, he's got a longer reach. He's bigger. He's heavier. Um, I think Pulele might have a little more power, but, you know, he's sluggish. He's plodding at times. So, you know, it's going to be a lot more difficult for him to land uh, against Barry, as long as Barry's moving around uh, properly. And the other thing that really comes into play here is uh, chin strength. You know, Pulele, you know, he might want to quit at times in his fights. Uh, you know, he might have a terrible gas tank, but I think he can take a shot a lot better than Pat Berry. Uh, we've seen now uh, against Chet Congo and then most recently against Sean Jordan, uh, you know, Berry just got blasted out of the water uh, and against LaFar Johnson. So, you know, he's had three times now where, you know, he's been hurt really bad in fights uh, by big, powerful heavyweights. You know, and LaVar Johnson isn't some... Uh, you know, super explosive, athletic, crazy, uh, dynamic striker either. So, you know, that's something to look out for. You know, if Barry gets clipped, he's going to be in big, big trouble because uh, he is a smaller heavyweight. Um, but that being said, I do think Barry is a, a more dynamic striker. He can use his kicks. He can potentially uh, get inside quick, land something, and get out of the way. So, you know, my pick is going to be Pat Barry. Might even have to, to win a decision depending, uh, you know, Polili might have a little boost in cardio because he's fighting closer to home. He doesn't have to get the big jet lag going. So I'm not really sure, but I, I do think Pat Barry should take this, but not very confident. You cannot trust his chin right now, especially against somebody as powerful as Polili. And uh, now, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this one? Well, in agreement once again, and uh, Pat Barry is kind of a, statistical freak here. Um, he's tiny for the heavyweight division. 5'11". Uh, I'm pretty sure he's the smallest or at least shortest heavyweight. So he is routinely going against much larger opponents. They're bigger, they're heavier, they're taller, and they're much, much longer. Now, despite being at a huge reach disadvantage, Pat Berry has been in that position before. He fought Stefan Struve, Czech Congo. Uh, these are guys that are really long guys. Um, and he gets inside. Uh, now, he lost to those guys, <laughs> but not before knocking down Czech Congo twice. Another statistical fact, this is actually in my book, uh, Pat Berry is one of the only people to knock someone down twice in the same fight and then still go on to lose. So that kind of tells you he has devastating power. Statistically, punch for punch, he is the most powerful striker, uh, at least in terms of Zufa career, that we have on the card. And this is a card with tons of good strikers. He also has... Again, punch for punch, the worst chin of any fighter on this card, um, just barely below Antonio Silva. So 
you know, Pat Berry is superlative in a lot of weird ways, both positive and negative. Very technical, very accurate, very powerful, and he has gotten inside reach on people. The question is, will he finish it? Because several times he's been in positions where he really hurt someone, and then he still ended up getting finished uh, by submission in both cases. And Pulele happens to be a pretty good grappler. You wouldn't know it looking at his win-losses because he, he gets a lot of striking finishes, uh, but he does have grappling credentials. Um, so that that's what I think keeps this betting line very close. It will be interesting to see where it ends up. I think some props might be worthy to look at. Um, the combined age of these two guys is over 70 years old. For heavyweights who have power and potentially uh, you know, a fading chin, that's something to, to consider. The under might be looking more interesting here if we can't decide on who's going to land that big strike first. Um, I'm not sure how durable Pulele is. I just don't have enough stats on that. But I do know that Pat Berry is extremely dangerous. He also has holes in his defense. So the the numbers certainly support what we're discussing here, and I think uh, props might be the more interesting play. Oh, excellent. Now, uh, moving on, we have a light heavyweight contest uh, between two uh, very different and intriguing fighters here. 15-4 uh, and four, Ryan Bader taking on... 14-7, and seven, Anthony Paroche. Quite an age gap for this fight. Uh, both guys have a pretty decent finishing ability, too. So, uh, Nick, how have the, the lines kind of shifted since you opened them for this one? Well, my opener was 585. Minus 585 for Bader to come back on Paroche, plus 385. I know a lot of people are going to think, you know, some disrespect out there for Paroche. But, I mean, let's face it, right away, the guy's 41 years old. He's been around for a long time. Definitely has some skill, but he just hasn't really excelled in any specific area. I mean, his grappling is definitely his best attribute. And against a lot of the heavyweights, or I should say light heavyweights, excuse me, um, in the light heavyweight division, he can definitely submit you if he gets you to the ground. I mean, he's going to have a, a way above average uh, BJJ game, but the problem is his takedowns aren't very successful. And against Ryan Bader, that's what he's going to need to do. I mean, Perosha's a lot of people are going to say also, I mean, he's coming off a knockout win, and it, it was impressive. But, I, I mean, his boxing's definitely getting better, and, and you can't count him out. I mean, he was, you know, he's kind of one of these guys that uh, can sneak up on you and, and definitely catch you on the feet. So he's no slouch on the feet, but Bader's going to have a huge advantage on the feet as far as knockout power, and his wrestling is going to be good enough to definitely keep this fight up on um, the feet as well. So that's why it's a stylistic nightmare for Perosh. I mean, the betting line out there, people have – Bitten and come in a little bit more on uh, Perosh because the line dropped about five to one now uh, for Bader out there. And the line's actually going to get tighter, so you're going to get more value on Perosh as well. He'll be at plus over 400. Um, I'm sure most of the time here from here on out, you'll see Bader actually increase as a favorite with the parlay action coming in. So good spots open. I think it's, it's a deserving line. I mean, if, unless Bader gets caught again, kind of like uh, Magalhães did against Proche um, in, in their last fight. I don't see Bader losing this fight. I think Bader has way too much knockout power. He's, again, he's going to be able to keep his standing. And Proche being 41 and with his chin being knocked out five times, not a good combination. So I don't want to really say much more about this fight. I mean, it's wrestler with big power going against a grappler that needs to get him down and get the sub. Wrestler should come through here. So my pick is Bader. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Uh, the main thing here for me is... Uh, you know, Anthony Proch, I just cannot get that seven second knockout loss to Ryan Jimmo out of my mind. You know, yeah, he's, you know, four and one since dropping down to the light heavyweight division, but he doesn't really have any quality wins. You know, probably the best one was uh, over Vinny Mangalaj in his last fight, and Mangalaj retired right after him. Granted, it didn't last that long, but, uh, you know. So, the, the thing here to look out is, you know, Ryan Bader has so much power. You know, he drops a lot of fighters, especially these. Uh, you know, these fights where, you know, he just had a huge step up in competition and he lost, so they give him another fight that's a step down, and he always comes through. Uh, look at the the bout against Vladimir Matyushenko where he just destroyed him. Uh, so, or the same thing against uh, Jason Brills. So, you know, he has the, the potential to, to really hurt these guys when, you know, he's getting a, a build-me-back-up type of fight. So that's something to look out for. And the other thing is, you know, even though Paroche uh, scored that knockout, you know, I'm not sure he's going to be able to land it here. You know, Bader knows that that's coming, potentially. So, you know, he's, he's probably going to be prepared for it. Um, and the one last thing to take into consideration is, you know, Ryan Bader, as good as he is, uh, you know, he does not have a great chin. You know, multiple times now he's been hurt on the feet. Um, but uh, I, I just, I'm not sure Anthony Paroche is the guy to, to put him away this time around. 
So my pick is definitely Ryan Bader, and I think the more intriguing pick is potentially uh, inside uh, under the 1.5 rounds, just because that kind of covers you in case Perroche clips him early like he did uh, against Vinny Magalhaes. Now, uh, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this one? Uh, yeah, Ryan Bader is everything we said he is. He's extremely powerful. Um, he's developed into a pretty good striker, considering he's one of these guys who was an NCAA wrestler stud that transitioned into MMA pretty late. Um, and he's actually a boss, and I think he's looked a lot better recently than he did when he first started. And the stats account for all of that career, and so they come out a, a bit average. Um, but I think he's looked sharper more recently. He looked very good against Glover Teixeira right up until the point where he got clipped and knocked out. Um, so extremely punch, extremely powerful punch for punch, but also, like you said, he has been hurt on his feet. Um, his defense, you know, in terms of strike defense, is good. Just when he gets hit, he gets hurt. Um, so that is a risk. But I, I do really like Bader here. Perosh is going to want to get this to the ground. He's one of these guys. He attempts over four takedown attempts per five-minute round historically. He only lands a very small percentage of those, which is, I think, why he's trying so hard. And there is no way he's going to land a takedown on Ryan Bader. Bader's wrestling is way too good. His uh, takedown defense is arguably the best on this card. So I think that's that hidden metric that is important here. I think if they stand and trade, Bader is going to be the more powerful guy. He's going to put him away. Uh, and Paroche, yes, he's dangerous with, with submissions. That's how he got past several other good strikers like Cyril Diabate. He got the fight to the ground and he got a submission win. There's no way he's going to do that same thing to Bader. Uh, and, Brian, I think you're right. Uh, this is another situation where both guys have ways to finish. Uh, both guys have holes. This is probably going to be over very quickly, which seems to be the theme of this card. Yeah, and, and one last word of caution uh, something that does slightly scare me, you know, listening to a lot of Ryan Bader interviews heading into this fight is, you know, he's been talking a lot about he you know, rushed into that fight against Glover right after he hurt him instead of staying technical and staying composed. And I think, uh, you know, potentially if he hurts Perosh, he might not rush in because he's a little worried about uh, giving up uh, some holes in his defense and, and leaving an opening for Perosh to, to clip him right back, just like the, the Glover fight. So uh, potentially... Uh, Bader might be a little hesitant to, to go for the kill here if if he does land something and, and hurts Perosh. So keep an eye out for that. So uh, And then moving on, we got the co-main event, another light heavyweight contest. Former UFC light heavyweight champion Mauricio Shogun Hua, 21-8 overall, taking on James Tahuna, uh, New Zealander, so fighting just across, uh, you know, real close nearby uh, in Australia here at 16-6. Both guys are kind of, you know, they're both coming off of tough losses, but, you know, both guys' careers seem to be on slightly different uh, uh, perspectives here. So, um, Nick, what's your take on this fight from the, the oddsmaker's perspective? Well, my opener was Shogun Hua, minus 160, the comeback on Tehuna, plus 120. And, of course, the initial movement uh, coming in on Tehuna. I mean, as you said, he's fighting close to home, um, so he's going to be the hometown hero there. And this is, I mean, on paper, this is a very competitive matchup. So I can understand the initial um, action coming in. And looking at five dimes right now, actually, um, I can see that um, Tehuna's coming in at minus 125. Shogun's at plus 105 right now. So the support has been steady. Um, I'm sure we're going to see a ton of action back on Shogun, and a lot of places probably already got that as well. So it's not as one-sided as everybody thinks out there. But that being said, it is kind of a pick em type of fight. Now, Tehuna, with the slight edge being um, according to the odds right now, I can understand that a little bit too because he is, again, once we just said, in his backyard, it should be a competitive fight. Um, both these guys have outstanding strikers, and both these guys are so similar in, in what they look to do. I mean, I think Tehuna here is going to look to – Obviously, take control of this fight, um, stand and bang a little bit, but try to get Shogun on his back because that has to be one of Shogun's um, weaknesses, definitely. He's getting put on his back and getting grinded out, basically. So I think Tehuna's going to look to do that. He's not going to want to stand and bang with uh, Shogun too much because even though Tehuna is a very talented striker in his own right, I mean, has nasty knockout power and definitely not afraid uh, to stand and trade with people, I still think that Shogun does have the striking advantage in this spot, and Tehuna's not going to be stupid. He's not going to take as many risks. He's going to, I think, play the safer route, especially with a little bit more added pressure, again, being close to home. Um, I think he wants to get the W here, and he wants to bounce back in, in impressive fashion as well. Now, let's not forget Shogun 
coming off a disappointing loss as well. So he's, I think, going to look up his game, and he knows how important this W is for him. Um, from all accounts, I've heard I mean, Shogun's training camp has been pretty solid. Uh, he's training with different people. So I think we're going to ha- see a little bit of a revived Shogun coming into this fight, and that's going to spell a little bit of trouble for Tehuna. I mean, the interesting part for me in this fight, again, is going to probably be how the wrestling plays out in this fight. Because if Shogun can get top position, then obviously he's going to be able to control and dictate where the fight goes. I think he's going to be able to outpoint to Hoon on the feet, maybe even uh, land a, a knockout strike um, on the feet as well. So Shogun, I think, has more ways to win this fight, even though it is kind of a toss-up. And you always got to be concerned a little bit by the bias judging. Um, and again, Tehuna's backyard, we could see it if it's a close competitive fight, have a little bit of bias going towards him. Um, but I still do like Shogun here because he is the better overall fighter. I think if you look at their track records and who they beat recently, I mean, for Shogun, this is a step down. And for Tehuna, this is, again, kind of a step up or he's still fighting a high-level guy. So really, it's Shogun's fight to win or lose. I think the initial action is wrong in this spot a little bit, even though I can understand it. So my pick is going to be uh, Shogun Hua to uh, pull off either a close decision here or even possibly get a stoppage over uh, Tehuna. Yeah, and I think one of the things to look into is, uh, you know, ground games. James Tahuna, you know, he, the only way that he ever really has success on the ground is if he gets on top uh, position and drops some ground and pound. You know, he's not going to submit anybody. He's actually very poor in the submission skills. Um, you know, when he gets on his back or he gets in a bad position, he's in a lot of trouble. Uh, he does not defend submissions well. He doesn't, you know, work well off of his back. You know, he takes punishment. So. I'm not sure he even wants to to go to the ground and risk it because, you know, Shogun, while he does take some punishment off of his back, you know, he's tricky down there. He uses half-guard sweeps, and he's got all those knee bars that he always is throwing at people. You know, they don't usually land against the higher-level people, but against somebody as unskilled on the ground as James Tahuna, he might be able to catch him. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Tahuna just try to keep it standing here uh, where, you know, while Shogun does have uh, an experience edge clearly and a technical edge, Tahuna might just have the better physical edge right now. You know, Shogun has been through so many wars. He's taken so much damage. He's gone through multiple knee injuries. You know, he just doesn't look like the same fighter that he used to look like. And, you know, obviously the, you know, the the, the Shogun that was the, the light heavyweight champion, you know, three years back would destroy James Tahuna in this fight. But that's not the same guy. It's not the same guy that went through that insane war with Dan Henderson uh, that took years off of his life and, and had multiple knee injuries. So I think that there is some, you know, a chance here for James Tahuna, especially on the feet where, you know, Shogun is probably going to be slow and sluggish. Uh, you know, the one thing to look out for, of course, as they say, as a fighter ages and, uh, you know, gets near the end of their career is uh, the power is the last thing to go. And Shogun has crazy sneaky power. You know, he's always dropping people, hurting people with the weirdest punches and the weirdest strikes, so Tahuna's got to look out for that. Tahuna has been hurt on the feet. He hasn't been, like, seriously hurt, but he has been rocked a few times, so uh, Shogun still could clip him with that, but I wouldn't be surprised to see Tahuna just put a lot of pressure on him on the feet and potentially, you know, win a decision or maybe even uh, finish him with strikes because Tahuna does hit really, really hard. So my pick is Tahuna. Not crazy confident about it just because of the variables. But uh, I just I like the the trends that their careers are going. Uh, this might be the time to to fade the the veteran. So uh, Reed, what do your numbers tell you for this one? Since uh, me and Nick disagree. <laughs> uh, well, it's pretty close. Um, but it's pretty close, and I have to remember the context of these stats and the level of competition that Hua has faced mm-hmm. versus Tahuna. Um, I think there's a huge difference in the level of the the supposed strength of competition or strength of schedule effect. Um, they come up you know, kind of even. There's some advantages here and there. It's back and forth all the way down the line. Um, generally, we see what we would expect. And I used to be big on Tuhuna because his stats were just through the roof. They've been coming down. They've been coming back to the – it's like a regression to the mean situation for him um, where the initial spike was caused by some outstanding performances, and it's been normalizing since. Um, whereas Hua has also maybe been normalizing, but he's also been doing that against guys like Alexander Gustafson and John Jones. Um, I mean, this is a guy who knocked out Machida, who's one of the best strikers in, in the UFC. So um, I have to remember that when I look at these lines and, and the stat line and think, okay, they look fairly even, makes sense, betting lines very even. 
these guys are actually the same age. Tahuna is slightly older. Amazing to, to realize that. You know, the, the history that Hua has in the sport, he is actually slightly younger as a, as a human uh, in fight years and MMA years. Maybe he's a lot older. Uh, I would certainly concede that fact. Um, but it's an interesting matchup. It, this fight is going to tell us a lot about the future of this division because both guys play an important role here, and one of them getting past the other all of a sudden makes that winner look very interesting. So it's an important fight to watch. I'm really excited for this matchup. I am personally leaning towards Hua just based on his overall level of skill, his experience. I think he's, you know, he's going to be back in there with a guy uh, who's a solid fighter, but is he the same level of a Gustafson or a John Jones? I just don't see James Tahuna being that guy. Uh, and so, yeah, this could go a number of different ways, but I'm leading Hua. All right, excellent. Now, we have one last fight on this main card. The headlining bout, Antonio Silva comes in at 18-5, and five, fresh off of his title defeat to Cain Velasquez, taking on Mark Hunt, 9-8 and eight overall, deceptive record, uh, former K1 champion who is coming off of a knockout-of-the-year loss <laughs> to Junior Dos Santos in one of the most exciting heavyweight fights ever. So, uh, Nick, uh, let's get started here. What's the odds maker's perspective on this one? Because I'm sure it's a little crazy. Well, yeah, I opened up Hunt, actually. It was a near pick fight, actually, and it's staying steady that way, but a little bit more left towards Silva, and you guys will see what I'm talking about. I opened Hunt, minus 125, come back on Silva, minus 115. So basically a pick fight with a very, very slight lean towards Hunt. Now, immediate action did flip the line, and Silva became a slight favorite. Right now he's at buck 45 a dime, so come back on Hunt about plus 125. Um, and we have seen Hunt getting a little bit more action as uh, fight time gets closer as well. I think a lot of people are believing that he can get the job done and keep the fight on the feet, which he's going to need to. I mean, getting right into this fight, I mean, as far as skill set goes, there's no doubt about it that, um, I mean, Bigfoot Silva is the much more complete and better MMA fighter. I mean, he's got the striking to go along with a, a very solid uh, wrestling and ground game. Um, and Hunt basically only has the striking, but he's got K-1 level striking, and he's got crazy knockout power, of course. I mean, he's one of the most devastating strikers in all the heavyweight division. And the edge that he's going to have is his chin. I mean, the guy, you can hit him, and, and the guy has one of those almost um, Roy Nelson type of chins. I mean, Hunt is that kind of guy. I know he's coming off a knockout uh, loss, to JDS, but I mean, that was just a crazy spin kick knockout, and still Hunt, I mean, you got to give credit for that fight, uh, that was a war, that was a great fight, so, I mean, Hunt is tough as nails to stop here, where on the other hand, Bigfoot, Silva, I mean, he's been KO'd four times, his chin is very suspect, he's such a big guy, I mean, the target, I always say it, on, I've said it along, you know, throughout his career, the target on his head is just huge, or on his shoulders, I should say, his head is huge, it's a big target, and Hunt has that kind of devastating knockout power that he could catch that target easily and put him to sleep here. So that's a concern for people. I think a lot of uh, you're going to see a lot of people banking on Hunt getting that KO, keeping the fight on the feet. He does have pretty decent takedown defense, um, and his wrestling and overall grappling game has improved. But n make no mistake, against a high-level grappler, Hunt is going to be in some serious trouble. I know a lot of people are going to reflect back and say he survived against uh, Struve. It's a different fight. I think Silva's going to get top position here if the fight does play out on the ground, and he's going to look to pass. He's going to, just going to be a little bit too strong, be able to smother Hunt, and then, again, grab that arm, look for a type of Kimura, a similar submission that Hunt has faced in the past and has been beaten by those submissions. So Silva, a huge judge on the ground. I think this fight, no matter which way it plays out, whether it's going to be Hunt getting the KO or Silva getting the submission or the ground and pound uh, positional control stoppage, I think it is going to be a stoppage pretty quick. Like, I don't expect this fight to, to last very long at all. I think that, again, Hunt's going to be either catch Silva's uh, chin quick or Silva's going to make quick work of Hunt by getting it to the floor and just dominating him. So either way, I see this fight playing out with one guy dominating now. Is it smart to lay the juice in this case? I mean, it, it's kind of tough. I do favor Silva because he is the better overall fighter. He's going to know what to expect in, Hunt, expect in Hunt's game. So I'm going to pick him, but not a very confident pick. I mean, it's, again, a, basically a coin flip to me. Um, as far as betting value goes, there could possibly be some value on Mark Hunt, though, as far as bets go. Now, that's where I stand on this fight. I, I, again, you've got to give a little bit more respect um, than most people do out there, I think, to Bigfoot Silva. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely some respect to Bigfoot Silva. While he doesn't have a good chin, I mean, the guy has 
continuously and repeatedly face some of the best in the world time and time again. I mean, just look at his track record. Uh, Fedor, Andre Arlovsky, Daniel Cormier, Cain Velasquez twice, Travis Brown, Alistair Overeem, and those are all in his last, like, eight fights. Or not even eight fights, like his last six fights or seven fights. So it's crazy to me, uh, you know, that people just discount him, especially when he's scoring wins over Overeem and, and Brown and, and Emelianenko. So, you know, he's got serious quality wins. Two of those guys actually submitted Mark Hunt in the first round when they fought him. So, you know, you got to take that into consideration as well. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, Mark Hunt has shown just tremendous improvement since, you know, joining UFC. You know, he comes in as a laughing stock, five losses in a row, all first round submissions, gets submitted in his first fight in a minute, and then ever since then he's had a really solid run. Uh, you know, knocking out uh Tushirer, Congo Struve, uh, you know, close the the win over Ben Rothwell, and then the Junior Dos Santos fight, you know, he he finally gets that huge step up in competition and he has an incredibly competitive, fun, entertaining war against Dos Santos where, you know, he did get knocked out, but a crazy kick with less than a minute to go in the third round. So, you know, on his way to probably losing a decision, but, I mean, really competitive. And, you know, you can't say the same thing about, uh, you know, Antonio Silva when he got that crazy fight against a, a top two guy in the division. When when you know when Antonio Silva fought Cain Velasquez, it was a just completely atrocious one-sided beatdown. So um, I think that Mark Hunt does have that going for him. He can take a shot if he can keep it standing. Mark Hunt is going to win. It almost hands down. You know the guy has even though he actually you brought up the the shortest fighters. I think Mark Hunt's an inch shorter than Pat Barry Reed, <laughs> which is just hilarious to me. And yet he's still out there, you know, blasting people, knocking out Stefan Struve, who's a, over a foot taller than him. So, uh, you know, he's he's got that crazy knockout ability. So if he connects, uh, he's going to knock out Antonio Silva. But what scares me, of course, uh, if Antonio Silva takes him down, uses his ground game, I'm not sure Antonio Silva would use his submissions, but if he can just get on top of him, use some wrestling, and then start dropping some ground and pound, I'm not sure Hunt's going to be able to get out of the way. And Antonio Silva has some nasty, nasty ground and pound. That's what stopped Fedor for the first time via strikes in his career. So he's definitely capable of doing that. But my pick is Mark Hunt, but there are multiple avenues for Antonio Silva to win, whether via submission or ground and pound. So, uh, Reed, what did the numbers tell you? Yeah, the, uh, I think both these guys are pretty known commodities at this point. We know where they excel. We know where they're vulnerable. Um, so the question is, can Silva get Hunt down? And his, uh, well, Silva's takedown accuracy is only 31%, which is actually below average. He doesn't attempt a lot of takedowns. He doesn't, he lands even fewer of them. Um, I think in this fight, he probably knows that he should do that. Uh, so this is another situation where we have there's multiple matchups on this card that fit this profile. We have a dangerous striker um, and someone who wants to try to get them down. It's definitely a risk. Uh, I like Mark Hunt. I think if if he lands even one exchange, this fight is over. And so the question is, can Silva survive long enough to get it on the mat and to do do some ground and pound? Um, we saw Stefan Struve work that same game plan, and he and he was doing it pretty well. He was throwing a lot of submissions, and Mark Hunt just showed he is surprisingly spry. He was, you know, slipping out of a lot of these attempts, um, which shocked me. And then he still had enough power in the third round, looking absolutely exhausted, to break a guy's jaw with one shot. Uh, that's the kind of fighter we're talking about here. Um, he's almost 40 years old. He is short. You're right. I think he, I, I do see now that he's only 5'10", so that puts him, I think, officially the smallest guy or shortest guy in the heavyweight division, not the smallest uh, by weight. Um, so, again, I think this is another situation where the stats really do reflect what he's good at. He is very accurate. He's facing a guy with a very, statistically speaking, poor chin, and uh, that's a bad combination to have someone who's that powerful and that, pre and that precise uh, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone. So if Silva dares to play that game, I think it could be over quickly. Um, so fortunately, the betting line is really close, and, and it allows people the, the luxury of making a legitimate pick one way or the other. Is this going to stay standing, or is it going to end up on the mat? Um, if it was you know, really skewed either way, this would be a situation where you'd, you'd bet the, under, uh, the underdog. Uh, but in this case, that's Hunt, and um, I'm leaning that way. 
All right, excellent. And one last thing to throw in there, if in case people forgot, you know, Mark Hunt was dealing with a pretty nasty staph infection since the, the Junior Dos Santos fight. So we're, I'm expecting that it won't have too much of a, an effect on him, but uh, that is a variable. Now, I believe that will do it for today's show, so make sure to check out at Premium Oddscast on Twitter. We Last time, for the last event, we gave away a free play uh, 24 hours before the event. You could have hit three units at plus 123. So uh, keep an eye out for there. We will be offering free plays on our Twitter account, at Premium Oddscast. Check us out, the Premium Oddscast on Facebook. Uh, big thank you to our sponsor, Five Dimes. And uh, make sure to check out Reed Kuhn's book, Fightnomics. It's coming out soon. Now, part two of the Premium Oddscast will be coming out uh, very soon, probably tomorrow. It'll have all of our picks, our, our premium bets, and breakdowns. So, for myself, Brian Hemminger, um, MMA Odds Maker Nick Kalikas, and the fight scientist Reed Kuhn, this is the Premium Oddscast signing out. Happy betting, everybody. Yeah.